Hello everyone, welcome to ITLS Academy. This is your mentor, Dr. Shamaita Basu. In this session, we will be starting with the topic genetic engineering of plants, and we will be covering the first part of this topic in this session. So before starting with the main concept of genetic engineering of plants, I would just like to give you a brief int introduction about this person, this famous scientist known as Dr. Borlaug. So what he did was he is known as the father of green revolution for his contribution. So he was the one who started the concept of uh, coming up with biotechnological crops, biotechnological uh, plants to meet the world hunger because uh, in today's world the population is expanding at a higher rate so in order to combat or on in order to meet the demand for food because more the population more is the demand for food isn't it because more the number of humans are increasing more amount of fat uh, food they will be demanding so in order to meet that increased hunger demand, uh, it is very important to uh, come up with crops or plants which will be uh, able to grow in a shorter period of time and will be expressing various properties like drought resistance, insect resistance, famine resistance, insect herbicide resistance. Okay, So these are the properties which cannot be obtained naturally by natural processes so for that what we need is we need genetic engineering we need to manipulate genes in order to come up with new train uh, new traits or improvised traits which will be helping us to deal with this world hunger problem and this person dr porlock he was the first person to come up with such ideas so he was a lower native and a nobel laureate in the year 1970 so as early as 1970, we can imagine he came up with this technique of biotechnological or genetic engineering of plants. And he used biotechnology and modern farming practices to combat world hunger. So his development of highly high yield and disease resistant wheat varieties bore results in Mexico. So the first experiment was done in Mexico. So where he came up with high yield. High yield means larger production in a shorter period of time. Okay, And disease resistance is also an important property whenever we are talking about increased uh, you know, crop demand. Okay, So countries like Pakistan and India which are the poorly developing countries uh, particularly at that point of time in the 1970s or 80s so it stretched the imagination of viable agriculture in the developing countries because these are developing and also highly populated countries recently Borlaug worked to apply farming practices and methods of increasing food production in Asia and Africa and he has continued to advocate for the use of biotechnology to combat world famine established the food or the world food prize in uh, 1987 and he expanded this with the help of john one of those months in 1990 and he died at the age of 95 on september 2019 uh, 2009 okay so now coming to the main body of today's topic that is genetic engineering of plants so i would like to start about plant cloning so i will explain it in this diagram only it's a very simple concept so cloning comes from the word clone. What are clones? Exact replica. And here since we are talking about a living organism because plant is a living organism. So only exact replica will not be appropriate. We need to say exact genetical replica. Means the genetic makeup, the genetic constitution of the plant will be exactly the same as the previous plant. So here this is the previous plant or this is we can say the mother plant. Or the parent plant from which we are going to clone another plant okay so what we are doing over here is in this diagram they are showing that we are taking the root tip okay and then we are dissociating the cells of the root tips as you can see over here so these are the different root cells that we got from the root tip and now what we are going to do we are going to culture these root cells in culture plates or culture petri dishes okay 
obviously under lab conditions and we will do, we will be needing to give the appropriate culture media just as we need to give to the bacteria for growing them in lab we also need to do the same thing when we are talking about cloning of plants okay so we need to give the proper nutrients that are required for the plant to grow and we are we need to create a suitable environment we need to mimic that uh, that environment in the lab and then we have to culture those root cells okay so as the root cells will get cultured they will be producing calluses what are calluses as they have mentioned over here so calluses are formed by vegetative propagation and they will be a mass of non specialized cells so that will be called calluses or callus okay and from that callus the new plant will grow so as you can see from the callus the new cloned plant is growing so this is the clone of this parent plant so it will be exactly identical with the parent plant so that this can be an ideal approach or an ideal uh, idea when we are talking about genetic engineering of plants okay now moving forward there are different cloning approaches that we can talk about so firstly i would like to mention about leaf cutting so the diagram that i explained in the previous slide it contained the uh, cloning where we are cloning the root tip like we are taking the sample from the root tip but it is not necessary that the sample can only be taken from the root tip we can also take the sample from different other parts of the plant which can include the stem the leaf okay the uh, roots the meristem okay so talking about that firstly the sample can be leaf cuttings okay so there what we need to do we need to take a stem of a leaf in soil and that will give rise to a new plant examples will include african violet snake plants gloxinia and begonias now these examples are important you need to remember these examples okay so i will just highlight the examples for you so there are some plant leaves which when cut from their stems and placed flat on top of the soil develop roots at particular intervals along the cut veins of the leaf the parent sprouts several baby plants all growing vertically from the leaf at various points along the veins example will again be begonia and geranium again examples are important so you see this will depend on the type of plant that we are actually trying to grow okay so different plants can propagate vegetatively in different ways so that will depend on what kind of plant it is and what kind of portion of the plant we are taking for cloning okay secondly we can also go for stem cuttings so in stem cuttings what we need to do we need to take a piece of stem uh, and then insert it in the soil either horizontally or vertically means either side by side or up straight okay and then the roots will develop downward from the stem and the new plant will develop from the top and then we can also go for stem with bud cut from the plant that will also give rise to the new plant from the bud so here the examples will be begonia so we have begonia we have gardenia we have christmas cactus we have lantana and we have impetens moving forward we can also go with budding okay what is budding we all know uh, that budding is a kind of vegetative propagation or asexual reproduction which is seen in case of yeasts where the one yeast or one full yeast organism will divide itself into two halves and then each of the two halves will respectively be able to give rise to individual yeast cells so that is what is budding so it is again common in propagation of many fruit trees means fruit bearing trees like mango apple tree etc okay so a bud which is an undeveloped branch leaf or flower protruding from the stem of the plant cut from parent placed into a notch made into a parent stem wrapped in place and allowed to grow until it can be removed from the parent and allowed to grow in soil on its own okay then coming to plant division so in plant division there can be many flowers 
such as the commonly found we have daylily i will just highlight it daylily hostas certain orchids are there and there are ferns also so they are cultivated throughout the division of their thick roots then we have runners so runners will refer to the wild strawberry plants so they will be uh, putting out their horizontal cells uh, sorry stems which will touch the soil and these will develop into roots from which another identical strawberry plant will grow so it's very interesting see from the stem root is developing and from the root another strawberry plant is developing okay and then we come to grafting what is grafting grafting is again uh, if you like want to understand with respect to the human body or the animal body grafting is done when say for example a part of the body skin is taken from a particular part of the body say for example the thighs and then that patch of skin is used to repair some worn out or dead skin in some other part of the body which is obviously injured so that is what is grafting so here as far as plant cloning approaches are concerned so we will do it by cutting from plant attached to a piece of the root or to the rooted stem of another plant then the pieces will become united and grow as one plant and then the desirable properties of each plant can be mated to produce a new hybrid plant without producing the hybrid seeds for example producing dwarf fruit and oriental trees from home landscaping okay now coming to something called meristem cloning it is again something very important so it's somewhat like the uh, plant cloning that i have already explained in the previous slide so here we are utilizing the meristem part there we have shown that we can utilize the root tip but here we will be utilizing the meristem part of the plant for cloning okay so let's focus on the diagram so as you can see over here we have a bacterial cell this is a particular characteristic bacterial cell which bacteria agrobacterium tumefaciens why this bacteria because the dna or the chromosome of this bacteria can easily integrate itself with the plant cell of the plant chromosome so this is a uh, candidate of our choice so this is the bacterial cell of this bacteria agrobacterium tumefaciens so what we have inside the bacterial cell we have a plasmid which is known as the ti plasmid by the name of the bacteria okay now why this plasmid is important or why we are talking about bacterial cell in plant cloning because bacterial cells are very unique because they express plasmid what is plasmid extra chromosomal dna means dna which is present outside the cell or outside the nucleus sorry not outside the cell outside the chromosome hence extra chromosomal dna means outside the nucleus now bacteria are prokaryotes so they will not be having a true nucleus they have something like a true nucleus which is known as a pronucleus or prenucleus or nucleoid so this is basically the nucleoid or the chromosome the bacterial chromosome which is present inside the nucleoid and this is the plasmid which is the extra chromosomal dna of the bacteria why ti plasmid according to the name of the bacteria okay okay so now this ti plasmid why we are at all talking about the plasmid because this plasmid has a very unique feature of having restriction sites and these are specific, specifically sites where a particular enzyme called restriction endonuclease enzyme can come and cut the plasmid at those specific sites and that cutting will help us to include any foreign dna inside the plasmid okay what foreign dna here we need any foreign dna which can express the gene of interest because here we are talking about biotechnologically modifying or biotechnologically manipulating plants or crops so we need to develop plant or we need to develop crop which is having a new trait which is not present in other plants so that we can come up with a increased yield and other properties like disease resistance and herbicide resistance okay or insect resistance so for that what we need to do we need to at first of all we need to come up with a gene which will be able to code for that particular new trait and for that we need to insert that gene or we need to insert that dna inside the plant cell and to insert that we need the help of this plasmid which is known as ti plasmid or tdna okay 
So this restriction endonucleus will go and cut the plasmid at various restriction sites and there we will insert the foreign DNA of our interest. Now this plasmid will be known as the recombinant TI plasmid. Why? Because it is containing sequences of a foreign DNA inside it. So now it is not a pure plasmid, it is a recombined plasmid because of the foreign DNA which has become a part of this plasmid now. Now we will insert this recombinant plasmid. If you see, look at step number two, we will insert this recombinant plasmid into the plant cell. So this is typically a plant cell. We all know that the plant cells are hexagonal in shape. So this is how a typical plant cell will look like. And inside that plant cell, we will now insert the plasmid, the recombinant plasmid. Now what this recombinant plasmid will do, it will simply integrate itself with the plant chromosome. Because plant cell means it has its own DNA, it has its own chromosome, which will be replicating, which will be multiplying. Now if we can make this foreign DNA a part of the plant DNA itself, then it will start replicating or multiplying along with the foreign DNA, eh, sorry, along with the plant DNA isn't it and that is exactly what our target is because that by that only we will be able to get a plant with a new trait because ultimately we need the gene and we also need the gene to get expressed for that the gene needs to undergo replication isn't it and for that in turn it needs to become a part of the plant chromosome so exactly that is what is happening over here as a result, the plant is regenerating, the cells are dividing, multiplying, the DNA is replicating and we are getting a plant which is showing the new trait encoded by the new gene which is transferred into the plant cell via the recombinant TI plasmid. Clear? So this is a very unique diagram or a simplified diagram that I have given over here because you know diagrams are something which always helps us or makes it easier for us to remember something and whenever you have been explained something with the help of a diagram it automatically becomes easy for you easy for your brain to retain the information okay so that's why i always try to explain things via charts or diagrams or figures okay so i think i have made it clear uh, the main concept of many stem cloning now moving forward biopharmaceuticals from transgenic plants a very important aspect of uh, genetic engineering of plants. So we have glycoproteins that can be made. Glycoproteins means proteins attached with a uh, glyco part, means a carbohydrate part, any kind of sugar it can be. Okay. For example, bacteria like E. coli cannot do this. So we need uh, transgenic plants for this. Virtually unlimited amounts can be grown in the field rather than in expensive uh, fermentation tanks because you know. Uh, Field study is something which has a huge difference in contrast to something which you are doing inside the lab. Because whenever we are doing something inside the lab, it's a controlled environment. It's an environment which is in, under our control. So the production is our control. Whether any kind of environmental change is happening, that is inside our control. So there is a huge difference between field experiments and lab experiments. And also there is no danger from using mammalian cells and tissue culture medium that might be contaminated with infectious agents. And the purification process is also often easier. Corn is the most popular plant for these purposes, but tobacco, tomatoes and potatoes and rice are also being used as transgenic plants and as, the, as a means of production of biopharmaceuticals from these transgenic plants. Now there are some biotech basics when we are talking about genetic engineering of plants. What are they? For centuries, humankind has made improvements to crop plants through selective breeding and hybridization. And that is the controlled pollination of plants. Means which plant will breed which, with uh, which plant. Traditional plant breeding involves the crossing of hundreds or thousands of genes. Whereas plant biotechnology allows for the transfer of only one or a few desirable genes. This more precise science allows plant breeders to develop crops with specific beneficial traits and without undesirable traits. Many of these beneficial traits in new plant varieties fight plant pests that can be devastating. Others provide quality improvements such as tastier fruits and vegetables, processing advantages such as tomatoes with higher solid content and nutritional enhancements such as oil seeds that produce oils with lower saturated fat content. 
Crop improvements like this can help provide an abundant healthful food supply and protect our environment for future generations. So this is basically what they are trying to say is that that the through genetic engineering of plants or through biotechnological uh, crops through uh, genetically modified crops which we will be talking about in more details in the upcoming slides we are obviously trying to meet the increased food demand or the increased hunger uh, scenario hunger strike that 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 is there but also we need to focus on the safety focus on the enhanced nutritional requirement because we need to think about the future generations means the child the children we need to think about them because they are in the growing phase so they need proper physical as well as mental growth so they need the proper nutritional requirement that their body demands so that factors are also important that we need to keep in mind now there are some myths and facts about plant biotechnology Number one, there are no biotech food products currently on the market. Biotech food products are unsafe to eat. Biotech foods are not regulated or tested. These are all myths, not true. Meat, milk and eggs from livestock uh, and poultry fed biotech feed products are not safe. Organic or conventional crops are more nutritious or safer than biotech crops. Biotech foods taste different than foods made from conventional crops. The United States does not require labeling of biotech foods. Biotech foods and crops have been rejected by consumers. The United States is the only country growing and consuming biotech crops. Biotech crops are harmful to monarch butterflies. We will be talking about this. Biotechnology is only being applied to a few crop varieties. The pipeline of biotech plants products is dried up. No new products being developed. Biotech crops harm the environment. Biotech foods cannot feed the world. Biotech uh, crops increase food allergies. Using biotechnology to improve plants is not natural. Biotech companies won't disclose where food, uh, where field trials of biotech crops are being grown. Biotech crops harm the environment. Biotech crops will cause super weeds to develop. The only people who benefit from biotech plants are the agricultural companies. So these are basically myths and not true facts. So discussing about some of the important myths that we need to uh, like get out of our head so number one myth is biotech foods are unsafe to eat this is not something very true so let's see what is the fact the fact is that we all know about fda that is the food and drugs administration so it has determined that biotech foods and crops are as safe as their non-biotech counterparts the american medical association the american dietetic association and the u.s national academy of sciences have also declared biotech foods safe for human and animal consumption in addition since being introduced to u.s markets in 1996 not a single person or animal has become sick from eating biotech foods other international groups that have concluded biotech fruits and crops are safe are the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, the World Health Organization, that is the WHO, it is one of the largest uh, body, the International Council for Science, the French Food Agency, and the British Medical Association. The European Food Safety Authority, that is EFSA, has also found several biotech varieties to be safe for human and animal consumption. Again, another myth is that no biotech food products are marketed. The fact is that 70% of processed foods on grocery store shelves contain ingredients and oils from biotech crops. The first biotech crop, which is a tomato, improved through biotechnology, was sold in the year 1994, like exactly 10 years back, uh, sorry, 20 years back, sorry, very sorry, 30 years back. The first biotech uh, commodity crops, which is an insect resistant variety of corn, were grown and sold in 1996, again almost 28 years back. Today, the most popular biotech crops are corn, soybean, cotton, and canola. Okay, now coming to something called BT corn. Now, where this name BT comes from, it comes from Bacillus thuringiensis, which is a bacteria, as we all know. So, this Bacillus thuringiensis is uh, again I will explain through this diagram only. So this particular bacteria called Bacillus thuringiensis it contains a gene which is known as the Bt gene and this gene is inserted into the crop and it has been found that this gene 
uh, attributes to pesticide resistance in the crop. So if this gene is collected from this bacteria and it is inserted into the plant or the crop, it becomes resistant to pest. So whenever the pest tries to attack that plant and feeds on that plant, the pest dies itself. So this is the diagram showing that the pest has died. So basically we can use this gene to manipulate or to produce Bt corn, which is resistant to the pesticide, uh, sorry, so to the pest. So the Bt corn is basically a variant of maize. It's a type of maize, which is genetically modified or altered to express the bacterial Bt toxin, which is poisonous to the insect pests. And the paste is the European corn borer. Okay, so see, this is the European corn borer. So in the normal corn plant, which is which has not been engineered or which has not been inserted with the Bt gene, this corn will success. Uh, sorry, this paste will successfully go and infect the corn, and hence it's known as the European corn borer. But if the same plant is genetically engineered utilizing this Bt gene, so this Bt gene will go inside the plant and it will start producing the Bt toxin, and it will help this plant to become resistant to the pest that is European corn borer. So the pest will die. Okay. Now coming to something called golden rice, which is again a uh, you know milestone in biotechnology of plants or in genetic engineering of plants. So this golden rice, it is a progress in production of transgenic cereals for developing countries like India. So this is how the golden rice will look like in comparison to the normal rice. So it is an achievement <coughs> by introducing genes that produce beta carotene which is the precursor of vitamin A in the rice grain. And since beta carotene means it's yellow in color, isn't it? It's a yellowish pigment. So automatically the rice will become golden in color. So beta carotene is present in the leaves of the rice plant, but conventional plant breeding has been unable to put it into the grain. Dr. Ingo Potricus of the Swiss Institute of Plant Sciences in Zurich with Rockefeller funding transferred one bacterial and two daffodil genes. The transgenic rice grain has a light golden yellow color and contains sufficient beta carotene to meet human vitamin A requirements from rice alone. Because you know vitamin A is very much important for vision. Vision and many other functions are also there but mostly vision. So it's very important that humans get this important vitamin from a food source which is as obvious as rice because rice is the main staple food, uh, staple food of countries like India, Pakistan and Bangladesh. Okay. So Potrickis has also added a gene from the French bean to the rice that increases its iron content over threefold. Threefold means almost three times, which is again very important or very useful. Now there are some proteins produced by transgenic crops. Let's see what are they. Human growth hormone with the gene inserted into the chloroplast DNA of tobacco plants. Then we have humanized antibodies against infectious agents like HIV, respiratory syncytial virus, and also sperm, which is a possible contraceptive. And then we have viruses like herpes simplex virus, which is the cause of it is the cause of cold sores. And there are some protein antigens which can be used in vaccines. Example will be patient-specific anti-lymphoma, which is a cancer vaccine used for B cell lymphomas. Uh, these are clones of malignant B cells that express on their surface a unique antibody molecule and making tobacco plants transgenic for the RNA of the unique regions of this antibody will enable them to produce the corresponding protein. This can then be incorporated into the vaccine in the hopes of boosting the patient's immune system, especially the cell mediated branch to combat the cancer. Cell mediated branch means the T cells and the uh, uh, mainly the helper T cells and the cytotoxic T cells which will go and stimulate the B lymphocytes to produce the antibodies. Okay, So we are basically utilizing the tobacco plants so that to cause some changes in the RNA of the antibody which will go and enable the production of the corresponding protein and then we can utilize that protein to produce the vaccine against the virus. And other useful proteins are also there which can be produced by transgenic crops like lysozyme and trypsin. Mm, 
so agrobacterium tumefaciens tdna which i have already talked about in details when i explained about meristem uh, cloning so there are some important bulletins about agrobacterium tumefaciens because it's a very important bacteria when we are talking about plant en engineering because they can easily integrate itself themselves with the chromosome of the plant cell okay so it invades the damaged plant sites it releases transfer dna which is also known as tdna and this tdna invades the invades the plant cells and is incorporated into the genome the infected cells will grow rapidly to form galls the infected cells will produce food for the bacteria the invasion is dna transfer between kingdoms and this is exploited to introduce desirable genes this produces transgenic plants like salt tolerant rice and golden rice Mm, so this basically explains transgenetics with agrobacterium tumefaciens so this is the back same thing basically this is the bacterial cell we have the plasmid we are inserting it we are producing the recombinant plasmid mm, and then are, we are introducing it into the plant cell and this tdna that is the plasmid is carrying the new gene which will be responsible for regenerating the plant with the new trait same thing basically and this is basically explaining exposure to engineered agrobacteria so this is the plant that we have we are taking discs which are removed from the tobacco leaf and then the, these leaves are incubated with genetically engineered agrobacterium for 24 hours then we are putting it under the selection medium selection pressure so callus will be formed shoot is coming out because this is a shoot inducing medium and then we are transferring the shoot to the root inducing medium so automatically now the roots will be induced and then we are finally uh, you know keeping it in a pot and the plant is growing in the pot expressing the new trait okay so that's about the first part of genetic engineering of plants i hope you like it please like and share and subscribe itls academy thank you